Chances are you've heard or seen of producers having like a hundred tracks in their productions, or if you're Jacob Collier, way more. And you may be wondering why on earth would there need to be a hundred tracks? Or maybe you might be thinking that because that there are a hundred tracks, then that producer must just be on like another level. But in this video, I'm actually gonna be showing you one of my own productions that's just shy of a hundred tracks. It's like 90 to 95 tracks right now, depending on if you're counting buses and stuff. And I'm gonna try to help you understand why there are so many tracks. And spoiler alert, a hundred tracks versus 10 or 20 tracks is not as big of a difference as you might think. In fact, a lot of people might have 100 tracks on their production when it really should only be 20 tracks. And I have plenty of songs that I've worked on where there are only you know 10 or 20 tracks it still sounds really big, still sounds great. And another little spoiler, the more tracks, the more headaches you're typically gonna have when it comes to mixing. But what I'm gonna do is dig into this production here. I'm gonna help you see that 100 tracks isn't really what it seems. I'm gonna share some major mistakes that you might be making if you do have 100 tracks or more that could be killing your productions. All right, so this is what it looks like. And as you can see down here, it's like 94. That's the stereo output, so I'm not counting that. Uh, but again, there's some buses in here. So, you know, it's, it's around 90 to 95, somewhere in that ballpark. But as you can see here, we have a lot of stuff going on and I'm gonna break this all down for you. I'm gonna simplify it all for you because we can really break this down into individual chunks. But this is a cinematic pop style track, so it's very big, it's very epic. This is a, a song that I co-wrote and then I ended up uh, producing. This is something that we were writing more for licensing purposes, so hopefully to pitch for television. So I'm gonna play just a little bit of the end here for you going into this last chorus. Can't believe the times I let you come back into my life. I love this song. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of how this sounds. It's obviously really big, it's enormous, it's, it's heavy hitting, and obviously there's a ton of tracks happening in here. So I wanna kinda zoom out here, and what I wanna do is break this down into individual chunks to help you understand why there are so many tracks, and hopefully help you understand how, just because there are, you know, 90 tracks, as you can see here, that does not mean 90 tracks simultaneously. In fact, I would argue that if you have 90 tracks happening simultaneously, unless you're literally working with a live orchestra, you're doing something wrong. There should never be every single track happening all the time. It's going to be a major, major headache. You can see in here, for example, all of this in here, there's like nothing going on with any of the drums. It's literally just like strings and some keyboards and then, and then the vocals up here. So even though these tracks are all the way, those are just the regions. There's not actually vocals that whole way. If you can zoom in here, you can see, you know, obviously there's a lot of empty stuff right in here. And look at right in here, like these vocals, we've got these, these are gang vocals here. Okay. And so that's just a whole bunch of gang vocals and they only happen two separate times in the entire track. We got all sorts of empty space in here. So the very first thing you kind of need to understand is that if you're going to have a production with like a hundred tracks, that never means or should not mean a hundred tracks happening at the same time. The reason why I tend to produce with a higher track count is because I'm trying to produce in a way that is changing and being manipulated over time where the arrangement is actually needing more tracks so that as the song is progressing, I'm putting some things in, taking some things out, changing the sounds, I'm manipulating things. So for example, if we kind of zoom in here, we can start to get a better picture of how things work. We've got two instances of Noir, which is a piano plugin, piano sound, but they're doing two different things. So we've got this, I'll slow these out. So one's playing the chord, and then the other one's doing that kind of melody. Here's that, tr that part of the song. And this is not mixed, by the way. So, you know, if you're saying, oh, I couldn't even really hear that piano part, it's not mixed. So we're not even there yet. So as you can see, we've got two instances there. Well, that takes up two tracks, just right there. Look at the strings right here. Obviously the strings are gonna take up a good chunk of tracks, but then this right here, we've got a track here and a track here, where it literally only happens at the very end because those are legato patches, those are melodies. Uh, look at the trombones. The trombones only happen one time right here <laughs> in this particular case, this, this uh, particular trombone patch. And then we've got horns here, only happens at the end. I hope you can get the picture picture here that I'm trying to produce in such a way where yes, there are a ton of things happening, but in a lot of cases, I'm saving things for very specific moments. So as you can see here, 
the end, we have the, the absolute most happening here at the very end. And it's very intentional. That's just, that's a, a very typical way that I tend to produce. I save the biggest moment for that last chorus, so it's huge. It can really, really hit hard. You can see here we got two instances of Super 8 doing two different things. Listen to how this works. They're doing the same exact thing, except one's high and one's low. And so let's go ahead and break this down. Obviously that kind of gives you the idea of like, things are obviously not happening all at the same time. So let's talk about what is happening. And really we can break this down into four sections of this entire production. And that's gonna make it a lot easier to digest. And so we're not thinking about 100 tracks, we're not thinking about 90 tracks or however many it is. Instead we're thinking about what are the larger groupings of tracks and how are they interacting with each other and how do they work, okay? So the very first one is the most obvious one, vocals. So I'm gonna collapse this track stack right here. These are gang vocals but then we've got all of our other vocals. And what you'll notice here is that we've got a lead vocal right here, but the lead vocal doesn't have anything in the chorus. Well, why is that? That's because I process my chorus differently. That's because I have the chorus down here, lead vocal chorus on a different track. So that's technically all still just kind of one track in the sense of vocals, like we've got just the lead vocal, right? But I've got two separate tracks that I'm utilizing for the lead vocal because I process them differently. I'm gonna process that vocal in the chorus with more distortion, it's got more grunge, whereas the vocal in the verse here. Give me time. It's a little bit cleaner. There is a little bit of a saturation on that, but not as much versus that chorus. It's a lot more uh, intense. And then you can see here, we've got verse two happening. This is kind of verse two, but here's uh, what I labeled as verse two, lead vox verse two B. And that's because there's an overlap that happens if we play this. Ready, left, there will be no next time. Two Okay, so there's an overlap here, which means we're gonna have to put that on a different track, which is going to add to the total track count. And then we look at the vocals here, and we so, so that tells us right there, three tracks for lead vocals. We've got that verse one, verse two, and then we've got uh, that the verse two overlap, and then we have the lead chorus being processed separately. And then that adds, that takes us to the next part, which we've got all of these doubles happening. Pretty much every single section of the song is gonna have doubles. We got the verse, verse uh, doubles right here. So if we solo these out. Don't tell me that you really wanna stay. Okay, so that's there. And then the same th exact thing happens in the chorus. We've got doubles. Leave no trace. Time is racing. What okay, so there you go. We got four more tracks that are just vocal doubles, just doubles. And as we get further along, now all of a sudden in the chorus, we've got much uh, fuller production. If I walk away, you So we got lead vocal, we got the doubles, we've got harmony, 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 right? So we got all these different harmonies and these harmonies are doubled in pan. So that's how we're getting that very, very wide vocal production. So when we just look at the vocals here, it's like there's not even as much happening in the vocals as it appears in terms of what they are doing functionally. And then we've got the gang vocals, which the gang vocals adds, what is it? It's like eight tracks or something. And all the, the gang vocals are doing uh, is this. That, and that's what that's doing. So those are obviously just track the same thing over, you know, multiple times, like eight times. And then obviously they're, you know, have some nice little grunge on them and everything. Uh, but again, that's gonna increase the track count. So if we think about just vocals, we have a lot of vocals happening, but even within the vocals, if you think about just the function of what these vocals are doing, it's not as complex as it might seem, okay? And then we gotta look at this. We got these tubular bells. It happens literally two times of the entire track. And because she's referencing, you can hear the bells chime. You'll hear the chime. Okay, so it's like one thing that happens, little off-handed thing that happens. That brings us to the, the next big group or category, and that would be all the keyboard elements that are happening. We'll kind of put the tubular bells into this. So we've got the main piano part here. And by the way, just as a side note, if you look at the very beginning of the song, there's literally only piano instrumentally. If we were to, if we were just gonna, we're gonna go ahead and mute out the vocals here and just pay attention to the instrumental, it's literally just piano, that's it. So again, you're like, oh my gosh, there's like 90 tracks here, but the whole song starts with a single piano and a single vocal. But then as we get into things, if we're looking at just keyboard parts, we would kind of, kind of break this down for you. Okay, we've got this nice little arpeggio thing going on here. Then we've got this, uh, this is from um, Hammers and Waves, which is by far my favorite keyboard library, like not even close. And 
and that's actually one of the presets that I made. And then uh, I've got this dulcitone, which is also hammers and waves. Another one of my presets as well. Sorry, they're not for sale. And then we've got this uh, pulsating bass, also uh, hammers and waves. Just adding a nice little lower texture. Okay, and if we want to put bass in here, we could put the bass in here. This is kind of a sub-distorted bass that's happening. And I think that's substance that I'm using for that. So we can go in here and we can just basically solo out like, okay, what's happening in terms of all the keyboard parts? It's just this. Now, when I play that out, that sounds big. That sounds great. It sounds rich. Y'all, it's like four or five tracks, right? Like That's like five tracks that's happening. It's not as much as it might appear. And then going to this pre-chorus, it, it subtracts, it actually comes down. Okay, and then we get into the chorus, which in the chorus, look at this, no keyboards. These are all muted, okay? I, I took them out because they just weren't necessary. So if we just listen to the instrumental here of what's happening keyboard and bass wise, listen to this. That's it, four elements, four elements, okay? It's not as much as it might seem. And that pretty much makes up the majority of the keyboards for the entire production. It really stays pretty much the same sounds, just changing up what they're doing, okay? And that brings us to the third thing that happens, and that would be all of the orchestral things that are happening. That would be strings, and that would be brass. Those are the only things that are happening in here orchestrally. And so then we can go in and start taking a look at like, okay, what's happening orchestrally? Okay, so that's the instrumental, and then we get into the verse. And this is what it sounds like. So then if we listen to the context of, of the whole track, basically. It's really simple. And then we kind of get into this next section, which is where things kind of start changing and morphing. Just chords. And then the chorus, it just gets a little bit more on the aggressive side. So I'm changing what they're doing from an arrangement perspective, right? Like I'm not just having the strings do the exact same thing throughout the whole song, right? And the strings don't even play the whole song. And this is the point that I'm trying to get to you is that yes, there are a lot of tracks here, but it's also intelligent arrangement. At least I think it's intelligent arrangement. I don't wanna be like patting myself on the back here, but I'm doing things very on purpose. And so yes, there's a lot of things happening, but it's also like when a lot of things are happening, there are other things that are not happening. So don't be thinking that hundred tracks, just slap it all in there. And the final thing that we need to take a look at are the drums and that would be all of this stuff and there are a lot of drums happening but there's also a lot of stuff happening that is textural okay especially in the beginning if we look at the beginning here check this out all right so we've got a topper we've got a couple rims that are delayed out and it's all textural stuff here that's one two three four five six and then we've got this reverse sub kick that's kind of whoop kind of getting into there. Very, very small detail. This is where it's like a lot of the drums that I'm doing is just more nuanced stuff. And then we get into like this first chorus. We have our first kind of impact and hit. We've got this TikTok. Okay, we're using a filtered out hit. And then we get into the full beat. We're using two layers of kind of these metallic hits as like the snares or rims, if you will. We've got the obviously kind of a trappy hi hat. We've got the TikTok thing, the sub kick. We've got some hits, and that's about it. And then we got this little cool transitional moment in here. Okay, and then all of a sudden now we've got multiple kicks. We got three different layers of kicks. I don't know if I'd really recommend you do three layers of kicks. I I, I might even pull one out when I do the mix, but. 
If you get the point, we've got a ride cymbal happening, we've got studio hi-hats happening, the trappy hi-hats, we got a snare, like a butch, nice, just fat, epic snare happening with those metallic hits happening. We got a hit, we got another hit, we have a cymbal swell. So all this stuff is drums. In drums, you can do a lot more and get really busy with drums without it hogging up too much sonic space. So all this is to say, when we break this whole thing down, we really look at it. We can break this down into four chunks. We've got our vocals on the top here. We've got our keyboards kind of in the middle here. We've got our strings and, and horns, which again, look, the horns are only happening for like, you know, 20% of the song. And then we've got drums and that is it. So the big mistake that producers make when they're just loading up tracks is they're just loading up too much and then playing too much. They're not, they're not actually thinking about utilizing the number of tracks to differentiate section by section to push the arrangement forward, to change things sonically, to allow for breath, allow for climax, allows for tension and release. That is really where you should be thinking when you think about utilizing a huge number of tracks. I hope this helps you. I hope this just gives you some clarity on kind of what's happening underneath the hood on some of these songs. If you have any questions, I'd love for you to ask in the comment section down below. Love to help you out any way I can. We'll see you in the next video.